Okay, let's do something a little more fun this time. We're going to be making the UI for the uh, battle. And this is what the battle scenes are going to look like. We have the sprite in the background, but this battle template is going to hold spawn locations, and this canvas is going to hold all this stuff down here. So if we look at the battle canvas, uh, most of this I tried to you know, use the original uh, Final Fantasy VI assets. Uh, these blue panels, it, that was a little tedious, so I actually made those in GIMP. Just real quick, the way you do that is uh, you just create the image whatever size you want. And then over here we got gradient, so you can do such and such. And I think I blew on the bottom. And you can extend that past if you don't want it. You can add another point or change the color, but I'm just going to extend that past. Basically it's like that. And then you can take the selection tool. I have it on fixed ratio, so let's get rid of that. And you you know go around the border like this. Then you would select rounded corners here, and then you can adjust how rounded. Uh, you can go to the paintbrush tool, and I, I have white as the foreground color here, which is important. And then stroke the selection, so that. And then I I select stroke with the paint uh, tool down here, and then you hit stroke, and then it, it does that. And that's going to follow the paintbrush size over here because you said because you told it to use the paintbrush tool. So obviously that's skinnier than I would want if I were actually doing this as a visual. Uh, so I do it again, and yeah, that's basically how I created uh, these backgrounds in lieu of the sprites. The Final Fantasy VI font I was able to download it online, so that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, so we got the uh, sprites I'm treating as kind of the parent objects, and within those are all going to be the controls. So let's start with, let's get one at a time here. So this one over here is kind of your main party one. Control node just acts like a container here, um, and that's going to allow us to you know size this and position it however we want. Like you don't resize a margin container; they're kind of designed to be within another node. Margin container, you know, pretty much like what it sounds like. You can you can play around with it a little bit like so, and then you can go up here and align it as you as you like to. You don't actually need this, but if you want to have that margin of course you want it in there so the grid container is actually going to be what's going to store these ui elements and uh, so i want to talk about how we do this at first i'm actually populating these in the code but i just have a dummy one in here uh no offense seven uh, to see how you would build it in the first place so the label is going to just be his name you know that matter doesn't require a lot of explanation as you know that's just the default value i put in there and the hbox container uh, is going to hold these two and the reason we want to separate those is because I want this space in here because you know again the original game has some space in here and the way I do that is on the grid container you go down to these theme overrides and this H separation obviously horizontal separation you control that here and within the HBox container I don't really need any separation there just the label which is the HP and the texture progress bar now the texture progress bar is pretty cool that um, Essentially, you put in your under and over, uh, excuse me, un under and progress. Over, you can have, like, if you want values over the max, it'll, you know, you can have another texture, I think, if you want. Uh, these, I actually just didn't gimp the same way. I did that outline. I actually did a three-point gradient where it's bottom, middle, top, just to have it give that kind of little bit of a glowy look. So you just put those textures in here and as your empty and your full texture, and the value will interpolate that for you. So whatever value... Uh, as out of this max value that you put in here, uh, you know, whatever percentage that is, that's going to be how full it is. So right here, if I put in, uh, like I have the max value 65, 536, which is what it is in Final Fantasy VI. So if I put down here, you know, 40,000, then you see it's that much full. So you can see this is just repeated like one slot for each of, uh, you know, each of those. I'll make a mess here. So I'm just going to hide those. I just hide the, you know, the parents because that'll hide the children as well. And you can see I did that four times, you know, HP label, texture progress, you know, and then just repeat for two, three, and four. The naming here is important if you're following along. So make sure the name is exactly the same as I have it here if you're going to follow the code. Because what we're going to do is we're gonna, when we loop through the characters, we're going to use an index of a list to determine which of these to populate in the code. So let me close that. And this left menu here, this is where you have the list of the enemy names. So what we have here is simpler, you know, just same control, margin container, and a VBox container. So the VBox container, so you can add a, a node here. And yeah, if I add a label here, 
and then I wanted to put in whatever Kravite. I'd adjust the font size, but we're just going to delete it. So like every every label that you add to the VBox container is going to automatically be, you know, vertical. It's going to organize all those vertically. So that's what we want here, is because that's all that is ever over here. It's just a list of the enemies that are that you're fighting. So let's get rid of those. And again, obviously those are going to be added dynamically uh, when we enter the battle. So the script is going to get this node, uh, which we'll get to later, and it's going to add them in. So this pop-up, I, I, that's not really the right name. I was part of the development process. This is this menu. I think we all recognize that one. So this one, I, I didn't try to do this dynamically yet, but it would be the same process. For now, it's good to have as a nice example so you can actually see what you're going to be populating in code, an example of it anyway. So this is the exact same structure, just a VBox container um, with these different labels in here. Beyond that, the magic list. So this is similar, but with a slight difference. So the, both the magic and the item one, they're going to follow this, uh, this template. Uh, we'll make, you know, we make them visible and invisible in code. That's why it's kind of plopping over everything here because they're only going to be showing up at certain times. So the difference here is obviously the scroll container. Now in the, in the magic list and the item list and, you know, when it gets created, the rage list, all of those, they're going to have more than can fit in your uh, display here. So obviously we need uh, an ability to scroll. So Godot has the scroll container, which is meant to be the parent of whatever you're putting under it here. And this can take uh, a grid container or... A, an HBox or VBox container as well. I chose Grid Container because I wanted to list the spells, you know, not just one column in here. I did extend it to three columns instead of two since, you know, we have wide screens now. So, you know, it, it would be a little bit silly. So for the magic list, we're going to have a little more complexity, not too much. This one, we're going to add an HBox container. So each, in, uh, each spell is going to be an HBox container in the code because we have a couple things here. We need a texture rect to hold the icon, like so. And then we need a label for the spell name. And I should point out how to do the Final Fantasy VI font here. We're gonna do the Final Fantasy VI font in code, uh, but to show you how to do it in the front end, obviously it's even easier. We're gonna go down to theme overrides, fonts, and it's font variation, a new font variation, and the base font uh, you, it'll take in a true type font, which is what I downloaded for Final Fantasy. So we're going to drop that in here. And the font sizes, I don't know why you have plural, but I found 60 works. And then the reason this gets squished is because of this. So what you want is fit with proportional. It'll keep it centered, uh, but won't squish it, you know. And then, then we're going to do that in code for uh, for all the rest of these. So again, if I were to duplicate that you know it, it's going to go in uh in the three columns and let me show that as well so the columns are right here you, you you set the column so if i brought this down to one you know it would only have one column and then it's just a v-box container uh but so you set it to three and then it'll automatically in order you know just like you're reading a book it'll put the three in there so that's just to show what's going to show it uh show up there for all of these and i'm going to delete those because again it's going to be done in code you know, different players are going to have different magic, so again, we can't have something static in there. Item list is going to be the same thing. We're go what we're going to do is add a label, and it's going to query the database and get... Um, and it would help if I showed the right um, list. And this is the same background, really. It's just uh, a different list, obviously. So we have potion here. And what we're going to do in code is uh, show the inventory. So I'm just going to put a space, a colon, and something like this, and we'll convert uh, we'll convert the uh, font in code as well. And we'll apply the font correctly in code as well. But this is going to be what it's going to look like. So it shows the inventory just like the original. And magic stats, like when you go through magic in Final Fantasy VI, the there's another window over to the right that shows the MP cost. I didn't bother with that yet because it was getting to just be too much for, you know, one video. So I'm going to, I, I'll add that, but just FYI, that's why it's not there yet. Uh, so in this battle canvas, so the hand cursor, I, I followed another tutorial that was very helpful. I will link that in the description as well. Uh, this gentleman did an, a nice uh, tutorial on making an RPG cursor. Uh, using just this sort of thing and a script that'll you know 
point it to the correct spot using labels like that. And that was a springboard so that I could implement that for all these menus. This debug output, I stored the game states in an enum, and that's right here. So right here, obviously storing the game state. Um, I just kind of followed a hierarchical naming uh, system so that way, like most of this stuff is battle that we're lo looking at now. So like every menu state we have, uh, we keep track of it in the game state. And that gets kind of confusing. So this is just for me, and I would advise doing it if, if you get into it. Uh, it's just a label, and we're going to populate that in code anytime we update the game state so that it shows the game state as we're doing different things in here. So the hand cursor, it is just here, by the way. I just have it hidden. Um, and the active battle cursor, you may recognize that. That just points above the character's head whenever they're the ones selecting magic or whatever it may be. This one, I saved it as a scene as well. That one just has this quick animation of the you know same original graphic with an upscale. Uh, and this is just going to run whenever they're selecting. So that so the purpose for that is obvious. If you want to know how to create an animation in general, the overworld uh, character controller tutorial I made will go into animating lock, and you can use the same process right here. It's just a frame animation on the Sprite 2D. Quickly to go over the battle template scene, uh, this I, I'm just storing the music in this battle template. It's just going to be under a node. Um, and the menu switch sound, which is just that little uh, sound that is made every time you uh, move the cursor. So I'm going to use that. And then I just have these. And I have one enemy, just to, as our example. And I realize I have active battle cursor on both the template and the canvas, so didn't need to do that. Anyway, so this one is another one where the naming is important. Again, if you're following along, make sure you follow this naming exactly. Uh, so what we're going to do with that is, again, from the database uh, I was talking about last tutorial, the characters, one of the one of the traits the characters have are row position. That's just going to be stored as a string. I put them all as front row for now. But we're going to use uh, that either front row or back row is going to match up to this. And then again, the index plus one, is because it's zero indexed, is going to determine which one of these uh, places that the, play, uh, that the character spawns at. So let's get into this code a little bit. So this is going to be uh, mostly in two scripts. So we have this battle controller script and this hand cursor script. So I'm going to go through the hand cursor script first. Um, this one's been uh, beefed up a little bit from the one that I'm going to link in the description. And I've converted it to C sharp, of course, because the that tutorial was in GD script. So we're going to go through this and, you know, it'll kind of come together. Uh, so the export variables, the node path. So what these uh, variables are for, are for like the menu parent path is going to be a VBox, HBox, or grid container. And that's going to be the parent of the cursor. So the, the, the cursor parent is going to be like, for example, in the magic list, the cursor parent is going to be this grid container. And it's going to look at the children of those container to determine where that, that uh, cursor is going to be. And the cursor offset just moves it over to the left and I think down a little bit just to make it line up and not be right on top of it. This is just to store the hand cursor object. It's kind of, it's basically singleton functionality like I wrote here. Cursor selected uh, is going to be an event. So this is a C sharp event, I should clarify, not a signal. I mean, they, you can kind of use them interchangeably, but this seemed the easiest. The way these work in C sharp is this syntax will define it and you can put what uh, an argument that you're passing into it and then this is the event name so just keep that in mind when we get down lower in the code I'm gonna show um, you know where we fire that off and I'll, I'll reference this this is gonna store the you know again everything's gonna be kind of like an index of a list so fight magic jump and item are gonna be zero one two three it's just gonna store wherever that cursor is for when there's a scroll container like the magic and item list we were talking about this is gonna store that uh, that scroll container Menu item is going to be the the thing that we're on, the spell that we're on, whether it's, you know, uh, the item we're on, anything like that. It's going to be the actual item. So like with those spells that have the icon and the spell name, it's going to be the HBox container that holds them. And the other stuff, it's going to be the label. And the parent's going to be, again, that grid, bo uh, grid container or VBox or HBox. Hand cursor mode is another enum I defined. It's just uh, menu or object. The reason for that is like, so when we do have to kind of change up what we're doing a little bit when we adapt that cursor and make it select actual objects like your characters and enemies. So that part I added and is, um, you know, in addition to what you'll see in that other tutorial. 
finger sound player is just that you know that sound again uh, we'll assign that to the resource this one is a public static method and that's so i can call it from the battle controller mainly but you know essentially any other uh, script can call it so if i'm in the battle controller and i'm messing with the menus then i can call this method and set the parent and then if necessary the cursor position and that will change the that rpg cursor so that it goes to the you know so that it's now selecting for that menu so and when that happens so when they assign the cursor to a new menu if it's assigning it to the item menu or the magic menu for example then we need uh, to implement the scroller so this just checks if its parent is a scroll container again using reflection in that case we're going to set that scroller variable to the parent if menu parent get parent is confusing uh, we just have to recall the structure here. so in the other list there's no scroll container so that is usually the parent but in this case we need the parent of the parent to get that uh to get that scroll container. This hand cursor, again, this is the cursor object we store, we're storing in this script, set cursor from index. This is going to set the cursor to that spot, obviously, and we'll see that down below. So these, um, I, I just made a region of event fired methods just to, for organizational purposes. So this is subscribing to events from other scripts, and that's done right down here. So the battle controller also has a couple events. And so what these events actually are doing is, so when we're in the battle controller and they select a spell, now we need to move to we're selecting a target, not a menu item. So th what this is doing is subscribing to that event. And what this means is when this event is fired from the battle controller, run this method in this script, do this. And the same thing for the reverse here. So that brings us to the yeah the ready function is pretty simple in this case this just gives us the object is this object that's the hand cursor we're on uh the, the events i just mentioned we start off in menu select mode when we start the battle so that's why this is initializing that this sets the menu to the menu parent path and that is these uh exported uh variables that we did at the top when we said export menu parent path export makes them show up out here so for the original menu, um, that's this VBox container. So what that is is just dragging this VBox container into this path. So that way the cursor starts off with the fight menu as its parent, even though it's not visible. And again, this is just this offset is just positioning that cursor. So this get cursor from index, that's another one public static so that another script can get the index at a given time. And we'll see how that plays in later. I'm going to come back to process because that's probably the most complicated. So target current. So you'll see it comes from battle controller. Um, characters and enemies is a list of all the characters and enemies together. And uh, that's populated over here, which we'll get to. But uh, just so we know, that's what this is. This is a list of all the characters and enemies and then by the index. So that way, when we're selecting the objects, the cursor will go around the characters and enemies. I did kind of a basic implementation of that. So, you know, it could be more nuanced, but this will get the job done for now. Then, the, So then the object sprite. So if we're on a character or we're, not, we're on an enemy, it's just going to get that sprite. So the object itself is not the sprite. The sprite is the child. So let's take a look at our enemy. Spoiler alert. You'll see the enemy is a character body 2D. I'm not actually using the detection or collision or anything like that, uh, but just to keep it the same type as the character, and we may use it later, the child is just sprite 2D. So that's what that's doing here, is this is getting uh, the next object and getting its sprite 2D node. And then we'd use the sprite as a way to position the object. So let's go to that. So you can see here, this, uh, we'll go to the method I'm calling here. What it does, let's get some room here. Uh, we get the origin of the sprite and then get global transform. So global meaning like the one, you know, not regarding the parents because that's that's one thing that can trip you up a lot is the uh, the transforms and everything. It's often in regard to the parent of the object. Global is just global. So the origin uh, will nail us right in the center. That will likely depend on how you have them saved here. Uh, so if you like position them it's going to change so you want to keep that in mind but it's what's more important is at least center them left and right so the uh, object sprite get rect size size i believe that's just the x and y length um so we're going to use the x value of that down here 
So what we want is this new cursor position. We're going to take the sprite origin, which is that global transform, that position, and we're going to subtract, keep that in mind, so we're going to move it left on the coordinate system. So we're taking the sprites, uh, the sprites X size, and we're dividing that by two, because if we move it to the left half of its width from the center, that should get us to the edge of the sprite. And I'm adding 25 here because the cursor offset didn't seem to do uh, you know, enough when I tested it. So this is putting it to the left a little more, and then zero because we're not moving it in the Y direction. And then here I just, for good trade crafts, uh, offset it by the cursor offset uh, X value as well. And then this hand cursor is the object in, uh, we're going to set the global position to, uh, which is, this is a Godot method, not mine. Um, and that puts it to the new position. So that's going to line that cursor up, pointing to whatever object that we're uh, uh, searching for. Well, not searching for, selecting. So, and target current and target next and target previous are all really doing the same thing here. You know, the only reason I mentioned it here for even having target current is because when we first select an object from the menu. So if I select bolt and I need to go to selecting uh, characters or enemies, I need to move the hand to that character or enemy. And the other ones are going to increment, like go to the next one. So when we first start off, we don't want to increment that, uh, that cursor index. So next and previous are just brother and sister here. So here I'm checking against the, you know, the characters and enemies. Again, that's a list of both characters and enemies. So uh, the count is going to be the total number of them together. Um, and then I subtract one because the index is zero indexed. So basically what this is saying is if it's if we're at the end of the list, start over at the beginning of the list, set this cursor index to zero, otherwise increment it by one. And this is the same thing down here in reverse. We're just going to say, go, you know, go, go to the count minus one, go to the end of the array and, you know, otherwise back it off by one. And then this is the same. We're going to get the next object, the same as we did in the original method up there by the index, get the sprite and then set that position according to that sprite, just like we did in, the, in this uh, method down here. So get menu at item index and set cursor from index. So these will look at, you know, the menu parent, make sure it's not null. And, you know, if this is just checking to make sure you're not exceeding the end of, of the items that are selectable, and it just gets out of it if that's the case. Otherwise, return the child at that index as a control. And, and that then, so you're, when you call this method, you're getting back the item that you've selected, you know, the Godot object. Um, I did change this to the, from the original to a control because uh, the original one was meant to work with labels, so it was you know it would have been as a label. Since we we also wanted to be able to handle HBox containers, they both inherit from the control node, so we can cast it as a control and get the property we need. Fortunately, so that's why it's cast as a control. Set cursor, we're getting the object, and then this is the you know the variable we're storing uh, up here the cursor index, that's going to keep track of it. So here, the one that gets passed in, we're setting it to this new value. Here's the part I added for scrolling. So this is just testing if the scroller is null and to make sure, again, using reflection the same as before to make sure that the menu parent is a scroll container if we're on magic or items, for example. And then what this does, uh, this ensure control visible, it took me a day to figure this out, shamefully this is going to scroll that scroll menu to the menu item that we pass in here if necessary and call deferred all that does is call during uh you know quote unquote idle time it's a godot thing uh so like i, I just to make sure it doesn't try to move the cursor in the same frame because i, I think that can cause problems um so this is just going to call whatever method name you pass in here as a string and it's this one uh, so once that's done, it's going to call this and then actually set the cursor position. So this set cursor position is the one from the original script. Uh, I kind of went in backwards order. Like this one's for the objects. This is the original one for the menu item. So anytime we're on any of the menus, this is how it's going to set that. So the selected global position on the screen, you know, again, uh, the menu items global position. Again, the control has a global position because we inherit from that, which is good. And here we're just setting that new position to the the X position of the label or the you know the spell or the item, the and the Y position, we're bumping it up a little bit. I think this is to get the finger to line up with the middle of the item so it's not right at the top. And then we offset it. You know, just basically all this is positioning it where we want to. You can mess with that if you don't like where it is. And then same thing, we set the object's global position to that new position. 
All right, now let's go to the process. This is going to happen every frame. So this, I hate putting this in process, but I assign, um, that's why I do the null check here. But if I put that finger sound player in the ready method, uh, what happens is it, it throws an error if that finger is invisible, which is how I started off since there's no menu immediately. So in this case, I just skipped around that by doing this. So this is just handling the input uh, to, you know, to do whatever with the cursor. I added this so like I, I don't I haven't even used cursor lock, but I think there are some situations where you're going to want to lock the cursor and not move the cursor. So this is a, a variable in the globals script. I guess I'm just using it to hold everything right here. And uh, that's going to get set in the battle script. So when a character's ATB gauge, their timer bar fills up, um, as long as one character has that, then it's going to set that to true. So basically, if nobody's ready, we don't want this to fire. So Godot input is action just pressed is uh, you know just a Godot method. And I left these as the default ones. So like the up, down, left, and right should should work. You can redefine those if you want. This just alters the input variable up here that we just set as a vector two. Um, and then I added this to the so we have the the sound get, uh, plays whether or not you can continue to the next one. And the UI select I made I added the joystick button, but basically the top of the four buttons on your typical controller to switch between characters. Uh, that's why it's here. And then cancel just to go back to the menu this is a little more of the important case here so this one i'm only doing if we're in menu mode not object mode because this is gonna you know mess with that stuff like the the h box or the grid or whatever so if the if there is a current menu item we're gonna play the finger sound and the reason for all this reflection crap again is because we need to handle if it's a label so if the current menu item is a label is all this is saying right here then we're going to fire off the event. You know, this is the object, this is the sender. We're going to cast it as a label and send the text. So all this is doing is saying if this is if this is a label, do this. If it's an HBox container, like with the spells with the icon and the uh, spell name in it, do this. And what this is doing is this is so this is triggering that event. So this is what I said I'd come back to. Um, this so this public static event event handler string means it's going to fire an event that's going to take a string as an argument. So cursor selected is the event, and what this does down here, this question mark is just a null check. It's a shorthand way of doing it. It's saying as long as the cursor selected is not null, don't uh, don't forget the period invoke. Uh, like the event always has to have the object, uh, like you'll see object sender when it gets generated in C sharp. So we're passing in this, like the hand cursor object, and then we're passing in the text that we want to pass with that event. So this just casts it as a label and then gets the text property. So like it, C sharp wouldn't detect the text property on the label if I didn't cast it because it didn't know what type it is it's a strongly typed language so it's it's good practice but it's a headache sometimes so in the same thing down here is we're invoking the event passing this in so with this we need to keep in mind that the current menu item is an hbox container not a label so i'm casting it as a control here and probably probably could cast it directly but this way i could fill it in with a vbox container if i wanted to that's why i cast it as control it's more flexible and then get the second child. So zero is the first, you know, zero index. So this is actually gonna get the second child. The first child, remember, is that little icon, the little white, um, black or gray magic bubble icon there. And then the second one, which is get child one, is the label. So we want that label's text. So when we fire off this event, we're gonna send the spell name or whatever command got, uh, you know, got selected. This just plays the sound, even if there's no selection. So I'll, I'll go over this check in a moment. This is some nice, uh, nice code from the original one that I that I watched. Um, basically, if it's VBox, we're going to take the input Y that was set way up here. We're going to use the input Y to increment or decrement the uh, index, you know, depending on the input, and X for the horizontal, like the HBox container. And the grid container, it kind of makes sense, is the product of the Y value and the number of, uh, multiplied by the number of columns, because that obviously affects the position. And remember, those inputs got set uh, up here, so depending on what was pressed. So here, this global, uh, globals battle selecting menu states contains globals game state. What the heck is that? So here, 
So the game state stores the game state. You know, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so anytime we change state, I'm also updating this um, variable. And the enum defines the possible game states. So those are all here. Okay. And um, I made a couple of lists to simplify the code in spots that we were just talking about. So battle states are just anything related to battle. So I don't have to write all those out in an if statement. And battle selecting object states are, you know, so anytime we're selecting a target, I didn't actually have to use multiple yet. I'm not that far, but um, we're going to check this list and see if, okay, any of these are the case. And this was the one we're referencing just now. If we're on any menu is basically what we're saying. And we can control that um, by, you know, adding those states to this list. So basically, if that battle uh, selecting menu states has the current game state, if it's any of those states, then we do the following. So that way, when we're not selecting in some menu, we don't try to select an index on a menu. This is the input for when you're selecting the characters or monsters. Um, and that's what this check is for. If the hand cursor mode, again, we only have uh, menu and object. That's all I have in there so far. Uh, so if it's an object, which we set uh, with the events, then this code runs. I kind of made a note to myself, we could select starting with enemies or characters. I just didn't go that far yet. I just use left and right and not up and down just to keep it simple. But this is where we say, okay, if they press left, target previous. If they press right, target next. And those are the methods we talked about before down here, where it's going to look at the characters and enemies and you know increment or decrement accordingly. Okay, so let's go over the battle controller script. So first, just the variables I'm setting up here. I have this FF6 font variable, so that way whenever I'm creating a, a label in code, I don't have to redo this. This pretty obvious stuff, character scene path and enemy scene path, is just gonna be, it's just gonna be where I'm storing them in our directories here. The menu switch sound, that's, you know, again, the finger sound. Uh, active character index, so I set that to negative one to mean there are none to start off, but any, um, so when you have two characters with your uh, bars full and you're switching between them, this is going to store which one of them is active by the, by the index and the, the list that we're going to, you know, that we're creating down here. So the current menu index, uh, this one is for if you're selecting a spell or item and then you go to target an enemy let's say it's going to store the index of let's say that spell uh, so that if you cancel it'll go back to that index so characters and character objects this is the you know the difference obvious here this is going to be the character objects uh, which have all the properties from the database and these are going to be the character objects like being the nodes that are going to get instantiated and added to the scene animations we're going to store and populating the characters right now i'm just doing the one where they you know the, so that they're facing left and characters with full timer bar this will will add someone to the list if they have their full timer bar i have not gotten to taking them away and moving yet that will we'll save that for next time enemies just keeping it simple right now a list of enemies uh we'll need it eventually and the battle timers because of course when we're going through the process method then we're gonna need to update the battle timers. This is just a variable to store that little triangle up uh, above the character's head. And this is the, you know, the texture uh, rec for the hand cursor object that's gonna go through the menus. So the fight menu, magic, item, and enemy menu, like these, uh, I have two variables for each, right? Like, so the sprite and the container that holds the items in it. So to visualize that a little better, yeah, here we go. So if we go back to the battle canvas, should hide that and we take a look at these menus, then we have the object that we're going to show and hide. Um, well, not that one, <laughs> but yeah, so like we're going to show and hide these as appropriate. So the object is going to be the Sprite 2D that's housing all of these controls, and that we're going to toggle visibility on because that'll nail all the children in the same command. And then the container is going to be whatever container is holding the selectable item. So the VBox container, the grid container, or whatever. That should actually be disabled for now. So that's what these variables are for. So I have them in a variable and can toggle the visibility on the menu items and clear or add items to the, um, to the other containers depending on the character. 
This isn't going to get used too much yet, but it's to store uh, which uh, whichever thing they selected when they're doing uh, magic or items. That way, if they actually perform an action, then we do the action on the selected object. Uh, this is the, so again, this characters and enemies, this is the one that was referenced over here. I don't remember where it and Yeah, so, yeah, so when we're targeting, that's the list that we're uh, referring to over here. And that's why it's public and static, so that that hand cursor script can see it. So it's just a list of node 2Ds that are going to get populated. And then uh, we're going to populate those in the ready method. These are two events that we also referenced over here. So here in the hand cursor script, we're subscribing to those events so that these methods will fire when they're, when those events get raised. So we create these events here and then they can be uh, fired off down here wherever we whenever we need to. So this is the update game state method I mentioned uh, before. This is going to set that globals variable to whatever the game state is. And this is the part that helps me out is it's going to display that state on the uh, top of the screen right up here it's going to fill in the rest of that that way we can track it so the ready this looks a little intimidating but a lot of it's just paths so here we're subscribing to the hand cursor cursor selected event and again that's this event and then whenever that event gets fired off over here in the hand cursor script it's remember that it's passing in whatever command uh, we tell it to. So here it's passing top action, here it's passing UI cancel. That's the string that gets uh, passed with it. Uh, down here we're passing the name of the spell or the item. So here we're saying whenever that happens, uh, fire off the cursor pressed method, which will take in, when, when we say this in each of those events, the object is the hand cursor object, that's why uh, that's this. And then the string is just whatever string gets passed in with it. So that's either going to be the, you know, the button or whatever we say. So this is going to run when we do that. So I just want to get that out of the way so it's, you know, events can be confusing. So back up to where we were. So FF6 font, that, again, that's the variable up, up top here. Uh, we're going to set these all those variables here in the ready method when it starts up. So again, we need a new font variation. That's just the object. And set can just be used, you can pass the property in as a text. Um, and if you ever need to know that property, just uh, hover. Like if you hover over here, you'll see there it says like focus neighbor left, for example, here. Like uh, you can find out the name of the property just by hovering over it like that. So I did that with font variation, the base font. Is then we're going to load that true type font. This is essentially a code, uh, code version of dragging that FF6 font. Uh, over to the appropriate place. So resource loader load is going to just, and you know, of the type font file. So resource loader is what you call when you want to load something, uh, you know, an actual file from your directory structure over there. So if you're loading a file, it, you know, it's a resource. So that loads in the font, and then that does not set the uh, font size or anything. You can probably do it here, but just to keep it flexible, we'll, we'll set that when we populate the stuff. So this just gets the uh, battle template. So remember the battle template has the um, those assets in it. So remember the battle template, wherever I put it, yeah. So the battle template has those audio assets here, those audio objects, I should say. So what that's gonna do here is go to menu switch and set that sound so now I can play that sound in code. We're just gonna start off with the vanilla battle uh, and this is gonna call that method that populates it on the uh, label. Hand cursor objects, pretty self-explanatory. Whenever So the battle canvas is saved as a scene, remember? So most of these are going to start with battle canvas or battle template, and then just whatever, you know, forward slash whatever it is underneath that scene. And here we set those containers and the menu menus that I was talking about. So it's literally just, you know, battle canvas, then that sprite object name, and then take that menu and within that menu, get the node of whatever type and just, again, follow the path and the forward slashes. That's all you got to do. So here are characters. This one I touched on in the uh, uh, last tutorial, the database one. So this is where we're going to start using that. So the database handler, um, get characters in party. 
again, we're just querying for in party is true in the database, and it's going to return that uh, you know that I enumerable character, and it returns an I enumerable. That's why we're actually converting it to a list like this because we want it as a list. You know, and then, and then we can easily iterate over it if we need to. So the character grid that's getting the main menu, uh, which is this part over here. If we again, if we unhid some of that, it's getting this uh, grid over here. So this is where we're going to dynamically populate those uh, values here. So that way, you know, obviously, so not everybody is seven. And I didn't have that as a variable from the top that we set because I don't think we're going to need to reuse this except for when we spawn at the beginning. So anyway, we got characters again. This these are the character uh, list of character objects so we can get their properties from the database. Uh, so for all the basically for all the characters, do the following instead of for each. I'm using I here because I want to be able to get the character at that particular place several times so I can get these properties. And so characters count will give us the end of the list and less than. So row position, of course, we have that um, stored on the character object, character name. So characters list in that position, give me that object's row position and you know name and all that. The spawn object, again, we have those uh, spawn locations. And again, this is where that naming comes into play. We need to make sure it's all named correctly. So that it matches um, but again in the battle template we're going to get the row position that we got from the database so if we back row them uh, then you know the next battle it, it preserves that and then this is just the naming convention i made uh, underscore player and the i plus one is because in the programming the list is zero index starting with zero but i i decided i'd rather mess with it in code than put like player zero uh, on my object name so it, whenever you see I plus one and I'm doing that throughout here, that's the reason is so that it matches the name and not the programming index. So the character object. So this is a, this is a good thing to pay attention to because this is a, how you would instantiate an object in the scene from code in general. You kind of use this kind of a pattern. You can use a GD dot load packed scene and then you just need the path to the to that scene and i just uh up at the top i put those paths here so i could change them if i want to I, I didn't get to do that everywhere but that makes it a little easier and then just dot instantiate instantiating it doesn't mean you can see it yet so first it actually has to be added to the godot scene tree so okay and i skip right over this this is important so the made node is going to be the um let me visually do it the made node is going to be this like the one that i named you now if you go back to the random encounters tutorial too like the one like i keep this naming is going to come into play here so it's going to be this node is the one i'm after so i'll explain why i'm doing this dot owner dot owner nonsense so the enemy menu container what that is going to be is the in the battle canvas it's going to be you know wherever it is it's the enemy container the owner is going to be this battle canvas this is the scene and then the owner of the battle canvas is going to be this node. And that's the one I want the name of. And that naming is going to be important. The reason I don't just do something like get root and uh, then get like the first child of that is because when you do auto load and you load scripts like here, what it does is it actually adds a node to that root. So like these would come before that. So if I, you know, if I add more of those later, it could screw that up unless I did get node of type. It just gets, it's not worth it. This works. So that will give me that um, battle area, you know, that battle area node. And then we're going to use the database handler again and say, you know, this is where that battle area collection, again, from last tutorial comes into play, uh, where, again, all it has is just the battle area name and the list of enemies we want to populate. So we're going to get it where, again, mind the dollar signs, where the battle area name equals that main node name and that's why we keep that naming consistent across the board and first or default because again this find method could return multiple so anyway, get back getting back down here we've added that enemy object uh to the scene tree and then characters and enemies we're going to add that enemy object into this list and that's and that's where this comes from that we've been referencing over in the hand cursor and everything we're going to so when we add the characters they're going to go into this and then down below when we add the enemy or enemies then it's going to go into that list as well so this is the part where we're actually uh, populating that uh, list of enemies on the left side there uh, so we're just creating a new label in code here just a new instance of a label and then again set uh, just like if you're in the godot ui hover over to see what the heck the property name is 
So under the theme override fonts font, that's what we're going to set to that FF6 font. And then this is going to set the font size. The enemy label text is then just going to be the enemy name that we already got. And then the menu container, which again is going to be the, in this case, it's going to be the VBox container. We're going to add that child. We're going to add the label to that VBox container. And then we will have Ryan Tour in the, uh, you know, showing up there. Now we need to set the actual enemy on the screen. So the spawn node is going to be, again, where that naming is important, is the battle template. We're going to, uh, I've named it enemy, and you go I plus one to get rid of the zero index. So again, that main node, we're going to get the battle template because we're back to the, you know, the main scene node there. Uh, and within that, get the enemy plus whatever number. And again, that's why that naming is important. We're going to use that index. So the enemy object, the actual, you know, node and sprite and everything, we're going to set their global position to the spawn node's global position. That way, so whenever you move those spawn nodes, that's going to determine that. And here we get the enemy from the enemy collection in the database. And again, so that way we have the enemy properties, all of its HP, so we can use all that stuff. That's going to get added to the, this enemy's list. So later when we try to, you know, do algorithms and stuff, we reference, uh, you know, the enemy and its properties. So this is a little bit out of order. I want to go into this cursor pressed just because it's relevant to that hand cursor stuff we're talking about. So let's collapse the ready and I'm, I'll come back to process again. The cursor pressed, um, let's take a look at that so not get too disconnected from before. So remember, the cur cursor pressed is the method that gets uh, fired off when the hand cursor sends us a command that it uh, that it selected. This will uh, print out as a, if, if I'm on a spell, it'll print like a you know, cure pressed, you know, it'll depend. What it, but whatever they selected is going to come through here. One thing I wanted to get out of the way here is uh, the if they canceled. So this is when they're in a certain... Uh, menu and they want to go back to the previous one. I base all this on those uh, game states we were, uh, we were looking at before. When I say battle fight selecting target that means like you know if they uh, some of this I haven't even gotten to yet but if they uh, if they hit fight and they're selecting a target I need to go back to that original menu so the hand cursor assign cursor parent and so remember that's why we made this public static assign cursor parent so you can t so from outside the script this should probably be an event too but I did, uh, too late. So th then we pass in what we want to be the parent. Uh, so what we're doing here is putting this back as the parent of that cursor. We want to go back to that menu. And then the not selecting target, this is firing off the event here that we subscribe to over here. And that chain, and all that's going to do here is, uh, you know, enable or disable the hand cursor mode. And, in, you know, in the case when we want to target somebody, we you target the current index object as the current index so yeah so we're no longer selecting a target we pass in this object and uh you do when you're firing an event if you don't have like you know string or whatever you're not passing in any arguments you do have to fill in this event args.empty which no one ever tells you then we're going to update the game state again that menu to show the the bit at the top and set it back to battle menu normal which is what i uh having for the regular fight magic item whatever so and that pattern goes down uh, through here. So if we're selecting target or selecting target multiple on entities, we want to go back to the menu. So we're setting the parent back to the menu. And in this case, this is where that current menu index comes into play for the item in the magic container. Instead of defaulting it to zero, this is what will keep it in the position uh, around the spell or the item that it was selected on, uh, selected before. And we're firing off the same event, same thing. Um, so like I said, I haven't gotten, I haven't implemented any of this stuff, but you know, this is just to form the mental framework like you have to handle all the situations like that. So if we're in the magic menu, so you got like three steps here, right? You can go to the original menu, you can go magic, it'll pop up the magic menu. Then you can select a spell and go target. So we covered up here going from the target back to the magic menu. This is the next step if they hit cancel again and they want to go from the magic menu back to the original menu. All of this is under if they hit cancel. So it's, so it's based on these states. So if they hit cancel and we're in the magic menu essentially, we're going to update the game state of course, assign the parent back to that fight menu container. And then again we're changing, uh, we're going to make that magic menu disappear because now we now it's we don't want it to show. 
Uh, same thing with item. It's the same pattern. We're going to go back to the same thing. I hard coded the index because the I know that three is going to be you know the fourth item in the you know it's going to be the item and then set that menu to false so that that puts us back to the original menu. So normal ba battle menu is again the one with the fight and magic and all that. So when they press the uh, the top button like the I forget what it is triangle <laughs> you know um, that then we want them to switch between players if more than one of them have an active uh, you know a full bar. So play the, play the sound, the switch sound. I scraped that off of Final Fantasy VI. And then this check is, uh, so if we're in, this is dumb because I already checked that. I should get rid of that. So let's, let's get rid of that. Because we can't be here if it's not the case. So if the characters with the full timer bar count is greater than one, the characters are going to get added to that in the process method, so they will be there. So that's where they're going to come from. So if there's more than one of them, then we want to actually switch which character. And find index is key here, because what the because well, what this is actually going to store is the index of the character in all of these list objects we're storing. So, uh, for example, if we've got four characters and two and th indexes uh, two and three are ready, two and three are going to be the two numbers stored in this list. But I need to iterate through the list, so I need the index of the list. So the indexes are still going to be 0 and 1. So this finds the index where that number equals the active character index. And then here we increment it. And then here we do the same thing uh, as before, uh, like in the hand cursor loops, where we check to make sure we're not at the end of the list and you know reset it if we are. And then we set the active character to the characters with full time bar new index, the incremented one. So let's go to that one so we can look at it. So set the active character is going to, we're going to, of course, pass in the index and this is where that's going to get set. Uh, we're going to set that variable up there to whatever we pass in here, which, you know, the one with the method we just came from is incrementing. And first we check if that, that active character icon is visible or not. So that little triangle above the appropriate character. If it's not visible, we're going to make it visible. The cursor player, this is the animation just to make that little uh, that little flashy animation start. We get the animation player object in there and then just play it. And this is just whatever you named that animation, of course. So now we're going to have a variable uh, for the active character object. We're going to say, remember this character objects uh, list is what we created when we added the character nodes to the scene. So we have that, and then just whatever this index is, is that's what we're going to set as the active character object. And that gives, then we take the uh, icon, the little triangle, upside down triangle there, set that global position to a little above the character, basically. So this gives us the correct object, and this whole thing, I think, okay, there it is, 65 pixels. And remember in video game world that like as you go down the screen the numbers are actually increasing so that's why minus 65 is going to put the position of it just above the head of the character and that could obviously be adjusted i probably should make it a variable so let's go down here to magic so if the command is magic meaning uh you're in the normal menu the fight and whatever menu uh this is if they selected magic so again, we've already established we're in that menu here. So this is like when it's magic from that menu. Update the game state, same thing. This is where we make the magic menu visible. And then populate the magic list for that active character. In this case, the, you know we're passing in the index. So that, down here. So remember those, uh, remember those uh, variables we started off with up top where we have the magic menu which is the sprite, which is the parent of everything, and the container, which is the VBox container, or in this, uh, you know, whichever. In this case, it's going to be the uh, grid container. So what this is doing is, uh, uh, if you don't do this, then every time we added the container, it would keep, you know, it would keep adding in endlessly spells. So, uh, you know, if you come back and pick a different character, this empties the list. No, they're not all going to have the spells anyway. The character name, pretty straightforward. That character's uh, again, that list that we populated in the ready method at this character index, give me the character name, magic. Uh, we're going to do the database handler. And this, again, the previous tutorial uh, is where we were showing the database methods, but get character magic for that character name. Um, 
but again, just as a refresher, this is all it's doing it is finding the magic list for that character and, you know, basically giving it back to us in a convenient form. So the magic icons that we're going to need to populate the this is going to be, we're just going to go GD load and then the path to each of those. And now, now so we have the character's magic here. So now we're going to iterate over the character's magic and say for each spell, you know, variable spell, this is some link uh, notation where we can, uh, since, since this is a list, we can say where, and this is again similar like a lambda where the spells, like the spell object where the spell's magic class is white. And then we're going to iterate over all the white magic and then populate that list. And the reason we're separating this, like see white, black, and gray, these are all the same except for that is that you know remember the original game it would organize them that way it would have all the white first and then black and then gray so we only need to look at this and then it's going to be the same except with that distinction all right so here we're going to this is where we're going to encode create those uh hbox containers and icons and labels that i did in the gui before so we need a new hbox container and here uh and a new text direct and here we're setting those properties so we're going to set the texture to this white magic icon resource we have up here so the stretch mode this is where we yeah five is keep aspect center it's an enum so that's why we pass in the number and then the new label so hbox container is going to hold this texture and this label so here we set the the font again remember the ff6 font is set up in the ready method and we set the same size here and then we set the spell label text to the spell which again which is this variable from the database originally the spell's ability name and then the container this is the hbox container we're going to add the icon and the label that'll give us the you know all in one object and then we add that whole spell container and that's your spell inside the magic list and these i'm not going to go over these two because they're the exact same thing except for the black and gray magic and the icon is going to change for each of those so just that icon that icon so let's close that so if I didn't already say it yet, like remember this assigned cursor parent that we get from the hand cursor, we're going to assign the cursor to that magic menu container, to that uh, grid container so that it follows those items. Item is the same thing, make the item menu visible. Remember that's a variable we set in the beginning. Um, and then populate item list, which is going to have a few differences, but it's simpler. So this is going to be the same thing. We're going to clear out any that were in there from the last character or the last time, whatever it may be. I'm just directly querying it this time because we don't really need any jumping jacks to do this. So we're just going to find where the inventory counts greater than zero. This is just going to be one of the fields. So every item should be in the database. Um, and if it's zero, we're just not going to show it. And then we just iterate over the items, create a new label, you know, set the font. Um, and then this part is the one thing we're going to have to pay a little attention to. So in order to kind of replicate uh, like we were talking about a while back, we want the item name, the colon, and the inventory count. That's what it looks like in the original game for the most part. And then the menu container, which again is the uh, grid container, we're going to add that item label. So, that, so that'll populate that anytime someone opens the item menu. And that's the normal menu uh, battle menu. And just as a refresher as we go along here, remember that this is coming from that hand cursor. It's going to send whatever item it's on as a string. So again, think of that like, okay, now we're in the magic menu, so any command it sends is going to be one of those spells. And same thing with items and whatever. So here the spell, we just find the, you know, we find the one that matches the command that was put in. And if it's not null, which we hope it's not, uh, we set the current menu index, which again, this is going to track uh, if we go to selecting who we want to cast the spell on, uh, then it, that cursor index is going to be needed to select the peep, uh, the characters and the enemies. So this is going to store it before we do that. So if they cancel, we come back and use this to set that index. So ability selected, I'm not even using that yet, but this is where we would store it. Update the game state, same thing. Fire the event off, selecting target um, and like I said, I didn't use enemy, but theoretically you could use this to say, hey, start with enemies if it's a black magic spell or whatever. Uh, but I haven't made it that detailed yet. And again, this is going to go over to that hand cursor script and go right here. So we're, you know, we're saying change the mode to object. So we're selecting, you know, such and such. 
And the same thing for item menus, the most part, except in this case, we need to, you know, kind of undo what we did with that colon because now we want the item back. We don't want the item colon inventory. We want to actually look in the database for the item that they selected and get its attributes. So we need just the item name back uh, from this colon crap that I did before. So the substring index is just, uh, I'm just separating it out. You could do this in one line, but it's ugly. Uh, so we're going to find the index of that colon. And since there's a space before it, I'm going to subtract one because I put spaces around, uh, surrounding the colon. And then we need just the name by itself. So we can take that command substring start at zero and go to the index that we set here. So then we have the past an item name. I was just debugging that. And then we get the item from the database with that name. So again, we're setting that current menu index. If they cancel, they're going to need this to keep it on the same item. And this is the static method from the hand cursor script. It, all it does is read that variable. It, it just, it's a method that reads this. Uh, we're going to select, set it to select the item, then we can do something with that afterwards. Game state as usual. And then for example, just like enemy, you could pass character. I just didn't actually do anything with that yet. So we've covered cursor pressed, sec, uh, you know, set active character, populate all that. Uh, we've covered ready, so it's to our process method, which is not so bad this time. So the battle timer, like in the battle control here, we're mo mostly focusing on the timers uh, when we're talking about every tick here. So again, keep in mind that characters uh, list that we populated at the ready. So we this gives us the ability to iterate over the characters. So again, we're using the index so we can, you know, get properties off each one like this. So this goes back to uh, my favorite site here on the algorithms, uh, GameFAQs, GameSpot.com. Uh, where they were gracious enough to, you know, outline the algorithms for, uh, you know, all, pretty much the game. Um, so what it amounts to here is uh, it's a constant times their speed or agility, whichever you want to call it, uh, plus 20. And divide by 16, sure. So the way we check their statuses is, again, this is ultimately coming from the database, which is key here. So again, we have the character object, which has all the uh, properties. So if the character statuses contains, you know, haste because remember they could have more than one status if one of them's haste then we're going to do this slow x and just otherwise we're just going to do this and again it's just this is just math this is how much we're going to add to that battle timer which has a max of 65,536 uh, so down here we're going to set the current timer value because remember we stored the battle timer in this battle timers list so we have one corresponding to each character this is just uh, if the increment ends up being more than is remaining to be filled. This just takes the you know the minimum between the difference between the current value and the top value, or the increment that we want to add to it, whichever is smaller. So and then if the battle uh, if the battle timer equals the max if it's full, now uh, this is where we're uh, adding to that characters with full timer bar list. Uh, so if they're so it's just saying if the count is zero, if there's nothing in the list, then we need to set the active character to the current one. If this happens and there's already a character, we don't need to automatically switch it to them. That's why we only set it if there's nobody already selected. And again, if they're not already in that list, we add them to the, to the list like so. Because this part up here isn't actually adding to the list, it's just setting the active character. And this sets the that variable. Uh, we're saying that any active player exists is true. That's always going to be the case when the bar is full. And if we're in the regular plain old battle state with nobody ready, then we're going to update the game state to the battle menu normal because this is when the you know that fight menu is going to appear on the screen. And that's what you do here. That should actually be inside this. because we don't need to do that if we're already somewhere else. Probably wouldn't be the end of the world. But yeah, an enemy battle, like enemies do have their own battle timers. I haven't gotten there yet, but this is to get a working menu. This is like the, uh, a UI, which is just surprisingly difficult for the end product, but let's uh, put this candy into play and show you the result. This will look familiar. <laughs> All right, so here we have the these menus, and you'll see the uh, cursor appears over Locke's head here. So I'm going to press the top action button, as we recall, 
and it doesn't blip like near the game yet, but you'll see it switches to Terra and plays that sound, go back and forth. Um, I haven't really done anything except battle state with fight and definitely not jump, but magic and item are the fun ones, so if we go to lock here, I'll hit magic. Poor lock doesn't have any magic, stupid treasure hunter. So I'll hit the cancel button, so it's going to detect and when I hit cancel, it's going to say, okay, it's battle menu magic. We want to go back to battle menu normal, and like so it does. And same item is going to be universal between them because we're just looking at the item database. So here, so if I hit uh, potion, now we're in this selecting target mode up here. And if I hit left and right, you'll see it cycles through everybody either way. And this is, again, controlled by that uh, those lists and that indexing we were going through. So I'll hit UI Cancel, back to Battle Menu Item. I hit Cancel again, Menu Normal. And so we'll go to Magic with Terra. She doesn't start with this, but because I wanted to test the scroll capability, I gave her all the magic for testing purposes. But this is what that looks like when we get the icon. And so each of these is an HBox container within a grid container and the parent is this scroll container. I probably should disable mouse here because that would screw it up, but essentially when you press up and down that ensure visible is going to move this as you can see. All the way down to the bottom, good. And all the way back to the top, whatever, you know. So awesome. And then so if you press this, same thing, you can cycle through. Again, this state up here helps me debug this and you can just cycle through all of the characters and stuff. So that was a little more work than I thought it would be, but I hope it helps. But I'll keep going with it. I don't say I'm going to remake the whole game, but uh, we're going to get a viable system in there.